for the group, uh, portions of the Quran, they repeat it in unison together, uh, they are required to memorize it, that's their homework, uh, they come back, and he is going to find that some of them are able to memorize and absorb more of the information faster than the others. So those students will tend to excel. And what will happen is that, you know, by the time he has gone to a certain stage, uh, some of those students will have larger portions of the Quran than the others. And they will have mastered the principles of reading better than the others. So what he then does, after he reaches a certain stage, as new students come in, uh, and he does a general recital for them, then those advanced students will take those new students, new students, and new students will read for the advanced students. And they will correct them, they will go over the passages, then they go back to the main uh, reciter. So that, you know, that the principles, the basic principles of collective learning have been practiced for centuries, you know, uh, for many centuries uh, in Islamic uh, centers of learning. I mean, this is just one example with, with regards to the memorization of the Quran. So the principle is quite applicable. I mean, though uh, it's, it, it is mo the modern, um, modern uh, educators of now, uh, or in recent times, identified its importance, you know, and have, uh, have stressed the need for utilization of the principles of collective learning in uh, classrooms. Similarly, the use of uh, learning aids, you know, which is, of course, very popular now in the various uh, modern uh, learning circumstances, you know, whether it be computers and computer programs or flashcards and, uh, you know, other uh, materials, charts, etc., you know, overhead projectors and things like this, you know, to enhance the learning environment for the students, uh, of course, Islam doesn't project any of these instruments. Of course, I mean, these instruments will be used to project the, the material, you know, from an Islamic perspective or maintaining an Islamic perspective. So, in an Islamic classroom, for example, or in an in, in a, a educational setting in which uh, Islamic uh, uh, principles form the foundation, these aids would be used to provide additional information for the students, for example, in uh, areas like the sciences, where one may not necessarily uh, seek to, uh, to um, overhaul the sciences and produce a new Islamic science. You know, which has 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 been erroneously proposed by uh, some individuals. You know, uh, but instead, uh, the media or or um, uh, teaching aids may be used to inform the students of the contributions of of Muslim uh, scientists in that particular given field, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which uh, tend to be neglected from many of the the modern texts. Uh, or texts of the past which uh, teach various subjects. So, in this way, those aids may be utilized to further enhance the Islamic content or, the, uh, or, uh, or clarify for the students the role that Islam has played in the uh, contribution of knowledge. And of course, you know, this doesn't mean that one denies the, the role or contribution of anybody else. Um, it should be when one is teaching and one uh, shows the different contributions. One mentions contributions made by other civilizations, etc. But the stress is put on the Islamic contributions for the students to to realize that uh, the mastery of the sciences and their utilization. Uh, in the technology of the society is perfectly in tune with the Islamic ideals. I mean, when one, one looks at, for example, the development of the mihrab in the mosque, I mean, this is a technological advancement, 
uh, in Muslim uh, places of worship, which provided a, a means of amplifying the voice of the uh, prayer leader, the Imam. And this was uh, an employment. The Muslims had no problem in introducing, utilizing this uh, as a means of, of, um, of amplifying the voice. Similarly, the minara, or minaret, the, which was developed to help the muazzin, or the uh, caller to prayer, the one who makes the call, to, to help that individual's voice reach a larger audience. Uh, it was raised up above the, the, the height, the, the, the uh, tops of the houses in a given city or town in order to, 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 to aid in that process. I mean, Muslims had no problem in, in introducing these architectural innovations uh, because it enhanced and served the, uh, the, the goals of, of worship. So, though Islam is, ten, is, is ten, there's a tendency to, to, to look at Islam or, or, or Islamic movement or Islamic society as being conservative in the sense that it's opposed to adultery and fornication and you know, these kind of, and they have severe penalties for it. You know, uh, it isn't conservative to the point of of uh, you know absurdity. You know, where you find, for example, some societies. In, in America, which maintain many of these principles which are found in Islamic society, but at the same time, you know, they have this uh, approach whereby uh, that they will continue to dress as their forefathers dressed, you know, in the 15th century or 16th century. Uh, and, um, you know, that is like the mode of dress that they must wear, or they're not allowed to use electricity, or they're not allowed to, you know, use modern cars, they have to use horse drawn buggies and things like this you know I, I mean this is really uh, it's it's absurd you know it is uh, uh, it is it is uh, you know if one did so for example to avoid pollution is another issue but I mean this is not the, the rationale behind it the rationale is that these are you know modern uh, uh, inventions which have gone beyond the, the scope of the forefathers and they want to stay in the same uh, channel as the forefathers and, and it becomes rather absurd in, in a number of other circumstances. Whereas from Islamic perspective, though, you know, in terms of morality, yes, there is, cons there is conservatism there, you know, because the, the, the moral codes are not uh, subject to human speculation and modification. They are fixed codes which are set by God. And as such, they will not, they are not modifiable. We cannot change them as the, the, the changing um, trends in, in society may demand or may suggest. But other areas in terms of dress, uh, uh, in terms of transportation and these type of things, you know, Islam and Islamic society has no difficulty in absorbing these things as long as they stay within the bounds of what is considered uh, morally sound uh, from an Islamic perspective. With regards to the student in an Islamic educational setting, uh, though traditionally, or maybe in the last uh, 200 years, the madrasa system which evolved in, uh, in, in response to the colonial, uh, Western colonial um, uh, control or takeover of Muslim lands and the imposition of, of Western culture and its values through the educational systems which they set up in these countries, uh, the schools, the madrasas which developed, came out of a period of, of, um, of stagnation, religious stagnation, where questioning was, was uh, discouraged. 
you know, where people were required to follow a particular school of thought and uh, to, to, to go beyond that school was considered to be criminal, to be sinful. You know, the, the great rigidity had, had developed within the, the Islamic legal system. And that rigidity spilled over into the overall educational uh, approach, uh, which then led to that that uh, very uh, rigid approach in the educational system of the madrasas, wherein information was being imparted, and no one was allowed to question it. You know, there was this the, the teacher was just unquestionable. The facts that or information they were passing on was unquestionable as the scholar would uh, pass his, his or his uh, fatwas or his rulings uh, and um, the people were not expected to question it. They shouldn't question it. Uh, it's not, it's beyond their capacity to understand. I mean, this is how it was sort of looked at. So the teacher there, you know, became an unquestionable authority and uh, questions were discouraged. So uh, it was just the, the process of learning was just one of memorizing uh, what the teacher had conveyed and memorizing it enough until one then replaced uh, and became a teacher likewise. Now this particular approach, as I said, is a product this particular approach is a product of a period of uh, degeneration uh, in which uh, Islamic scholarship had reached its lows now the Quran itself invites questioning. Allah states, "Fasalu ahl al-dikri in kuntum la ta'alamun." Ask those who know. If you don't know, you ask. The question is not limited merely to 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 get the information, but to understand that information. I mean, which would require other questioning, and the tradition of the early scholarship from the time of the Sahaba, the Prophet Muhammad when they would ask the Prophet Muhammad questions to get clarification. You know, when he said uh, that <clears throat> that Allah created some people for the hellfire and some people for paradise, you know, the companions asked him, well then what's the point in uh, doing any, uh, you know, any, any good? It has already been set and fixed, you know. Um, there are many instances where, where the Prophet Muhammad made different statements and they asked him for clarification. You know? So, I mean, he didn't discourage this, to gain, you know, to gain clarification. He did discourage excessive questioning. That's where, where people, you know, uh, question unnecessarily. They're going to extremes in questioning, like that which is mentioned in the Quran with regards to the, the, the calf who was to be slaughtered. Uh, when Prophet Moses told the people to slaughter a, um, a calf, you know, they were questioning uh, how big, what color, you know, and all these kind of things. They were going to extremes uh, to the point where they almost didn't do it at all. Whereas, you know, from the Islamic perspective, you know, questioning to gain uh, deeper understanding, this is, this is uh, encouraged. And this was the, the way of the... the uh, Students who studied under the companions of the Prophet, may God sit and be him, and the scholars who came after them. And when we look into the the lives of uh, scholars like uh, Abu Hanifa and the others, uh, you find that they were discouraging their companions, their, their their students, their contemporaries from blind following, and encouraging them to to question and to to find the sources of uh, statements that are made or positions that are taken. I mean, this is a, a general uh, recommendation to ensure that people do not fall into uh, this mode of, of, of blind following which, which numbs the brain and, 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 and makes one feel incapable of determining for oneself or, you know, uh, where the maulana or the the religious scholar becomes like a priest who depend, dispenses uh, formula and uh, prescriptions uh, for things uh, without any um, explanation. You know, he is, he is uh, close to God and whatever he has 
as narrated, it must be accepted. And this is very not in accordance with the Islamic outlook on uh, the gaining of knowledge. You know, the student is not encouraged to be a blind follower, but to benefit from the knowledge of those who came before, to respect those who are teaching them, because the issue of respect is very, very important. Uh, this is the Prophet, may God's peace must be upon him, and stated that, you know, whoever doesn't respect the scholars is not, you know, a true follower of his. So respect for scholars should be there, those who are knowledgeable who are passing on that information. But that respect doesn't mean, you know, blind following, because if, if one gives to other human beings the, that kind of respect, or you know, respect to that degree where they will follow them blindly, then in doing so they have destroyed the respect which was due to the Prophet. May God peace and be upon him. That he was the only one who should be followed in that fashion. This is the essence of the declaration of faith, the second part of the declaration of faith, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That he, may God peace and be upon him, was guided by revelation, his errors were were corrected and became a source of guidance. I mean, of course, one must clarify that these errors were not errors of sin, but errors in judgment between what is uh, good and what is better. But the point is that, uh, you know, Allah corrected when He made those kind of uh, errors in judgment, and uh, they became, as I said, sources of guidance for the followers and for the Muslim uh, community in the generations that followed. So, he is the only one who was to be followed like this because Allah stated with regards to following him, Allah, whoever obeys the messenger, has obeyed Allah. So, he is in a special category. Whatever the Prophet has given you uh, should be accepted and followed and whatever he has forbidden you should be avoided, accepted and avoided. You know, this is a special category that he has, which is unique to him. This is what being the messenger of Allah means. So now if this kind of obedience or this kind of following is now attributed or given to other human beings, then it, 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 uh, it puts them on the same level of the, as the Prophet. May God peace and be upon him. You know, Allah has stated in the Quran that you know, loving God is expressed by following the Prophet. I mean, this is how Allah has said that, and specifically in their regard. But this is not said for any other human being. This is not said for other scholars. Although we are told to believe, to obey those who are in authority over us. You know, oh, you believe, obey Allah and the Messenger, and those in authority over us. And of course, this includes scholars of such to obey them where they have instructed us. You know, and where, you know, the evidence, as far as we can see, for their instruction is, is firm. Because the, 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 the scholars were human beings and committed errors, not intentionally, necessarily, but they committed errors, they were in error, uh, as is the case of all human beings, as the Prophet may God peace and blessing be upon him, had said, Kullu bani Adam khapa, every descendant of Adam commits errors, constantly commits errors. So questioning, you know, and seeking the origin of rulings and, and uh, using this faculty, you know, uh, questioning, not necessarily representing doubts, because of course, you know, that's a source of questioning also, but just questioning for clarification. I mean, this is a part of the Islamic tradition in learning. And this has to be there. It has to be revived, you know, where it is missing. And uh, be recognized as a pillar of Islamic learning with regards to the student and the teacher. Uh, perhaps the last component of the learning process 
uh, could be referred to as the learning environment. Uh, the learning process began in the mosques, and um, they were also in the homes of uh, Ibn Abbas and Ibn Mas- Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companions used to hold classes in their homes. People used to come to the home of Aisha, uh, the wife of the Prophet, وسلم, and study under her, gain knowledge from her. So uh, these represent uh, different aspects of uh, learning environment. Um, we could say that the learning environment does have uh, a role in the process of learning and um, as such from the point of view of the Islamic point of view with regards to education you know that environment should be as supportive of both the student and the teacher you know as possible Part of the way in which the environment is, is uh, affected is that there is a separation of sexes in the co- course of education from an Islamic perspective. Uh, that environment where students are, uh, are mixed together, you know, clearly affects their learning abilities for one, uh, you know, the distractions that, that are natural uh, when young men and women or are placed in the same uh, learning uh, environment or is, uh, is avoided in the Islamic uh, point of view you know as training as really part of their training is for, for life in the Islamic environment where there is a separation of the sexes of course you know, this is in the er- this is in the latter stages of education, in the very early stages, primary stages. You know, until the child reaches about the age of ten. You know, the- it is permissible uh, from an Islamic perspective that the children uh, uh, that the children learn together. <clears throat> but you know, once uh, maturity starts to set in, which is and somewhere around the age of 10, it's based on the fact that the Prophet, may God peace and blessings be upon him, had said, teach your children prayer at the age of 7, and thank them for it, you know, for abandoning it and, and, and deliberately not doing it, at the age of 10 to, you know, this is a, this is a time when now, uh, and also separate them in their beds, he went on to explain. The children should be separated in their beds, they don't uh, mix up, uh, you know, beyond that point, because this is where the beginnings of uh, consciousness, sexual consciousness, start to develop. Or the major age. Of course, if children are detected at an earlier stage to have this consciousness, then they should be uh, separated out. So the learning environment is one in which there is a separation of the sexes, basically from an Islamic perspective. This is a part of the Islamic educational environment uh, for children uh, or young people to, uh, you know, over the age of 10. Studies, Western studies have shown, you know, although uh, this was the practice in the past and which has been uh, supplemented in, uh, at a certain point in Western history, I mean, study, recent studies have shown that, you know, in both boys and girls, you know, are, are more, are better learners when the environment is a single sex environment. Uh, of course, you know, you know, other studies have shown uh, certain things in terms of behavior. Uh, some have pointed out that the boys tend to be a bit rougher and cruder, you know, when they're all together. Uh, but the girls, when they when they study together, they tend to be more outward. They're not overshadowed by the male in their presence, and they tend to speak out more and tend to be more uh, progressive. Uh, so when we weigh the moral factor or, or the character factor with regards to the boys in relationship to the academic benefits on both sides as well as the, the um, developmental benefits for the, for the young women, uh, then that issue of boys and their behavior um, becomes you know, of lesser importance. Though it should be tackled, it's something that if it's known that this is a natural phenomenon, then obviously there is a need for you know a stronger discipline uh, in uh, in these type of environments. 
and uh, this may be something which has been observed, you know, uh, to the report that I had uh, looked at, was one being given by a female teacher, a teacher who was teaching a group of, you know, all males. And um, how the boys relate in an environment where there's a female teacher is quite different from, from that of a male teacher. 